the NFL playoffs are here, and it is going to be chaos personified. Let's discuss it this week on Iceman and Coach. What's up, everyone? Welcome back to another episode of Iceman and Coach. The coach is here with me. The national championship game, or the natty as we like to call it, is on behind me. It is a great day in sports. Coach, welcome back. First show of the new year. How you doing, brother? Iceman, doing great. Happy to be starting the new year off um, back here on Iceman and Coach. Getting things going. Got the natty going. It's not going too well for the Horn Frogs, unfortunately. You know me. Sucker for an underdog, and they were a big one. Uh, not going great now, but I tell you what, they've come back a few times this year, so we'll see if there's any more magic left. And uh, looking forward to the NFL playoffs coming up. Be honest with the listeners. Did you take the Frogs with the points this time? Didn't touch it. I didn't touch it at all. You know, I kind of like, I'll, I'll kind of come out of, uh, I guess we'll call it retirement occasionally here for a few weeks and I'll back off, you know, here and there. I just dabble. I don't like to get too ingrained in it. I feel like it's a little dangerous. Oh, gambling is a dangerous game. That's why the Iceman doesn't partake in that kind of thing. And I feel like my finances are in a good place for that because gambling football is not easy to do. Bounce here, bounce there. Could be a bad beat or a good beat. Depends on what happens. But I don't take any of that going going i don't know it's just not a wise use of my money let's put it that way no i mean the vegas look at all the hotels and everything the casinos if it was a bad deal for them they would have been out of business a long long time ago and then i mean let's just look around at the uh the generation of american sports fans and they just have to be grinning ear to ear in vegas looking at some of these uh these folks that are throwing money down on games thinking they know it all have you ever met anybody who touted the fact that they got things comped in vegas or at a casino because that's hilarious yeah, uh, actually, I worked with a guy when I was working at the high school and coaching and things like that. He was a fellow coach, great guy to hang around with, hang around with, great guy to drink beer with. He was actually the state of Illinois athlete of the year uh, when he was in high school, which is a shocker. But he was a big gambler, single guy. He was like in his early 40s, single guy and would gamble like crazy. And I mean, he'd hit it big once in a while when, you know, twenty five hundred bucks or something at the casino. But he'd tell, talk all the time about how they'd comp him a room for the night or this or that. It's like, man, like you've paid for that room 10 times over. <laughs> I know. That's the best part is you know that they have lost big. So the casino is going to let you in every single time. I always find that funny. Gambling to me is very funny. And I think today's in today's sports world, it's obviously very commonplace, but it's not something that I touch. So last week you weren't here and I almost didn't come out with an episode because as I said last week, it's nice to take a little bit of a time off to, you know, take a, a little bit of a break, but something happened the week prior that we didn't get to talk to. And that was the DeMar Hamlin situation in Buffalo. Just to very quickly recap for everybody, DeMar Hamlin is a safety for the Buffalo Bills. I believe it was in his second year, 24 years old, took a hit from T Higgins on a bang bang play, which happens all the time in the NFL and just in football in general. And a couple seconds later collapsed on the field. He had to be resuscitated not once, but twice. And fast forward a week later, he got discharged this morning, but there has been a lot of narrative, a lot of talk about what happened. And I gave my thoughts about it and my disappointment in the way that the NFL seemed to want to handle it in the moment. But now that we are a week later and you're here, I kind of want to open it again and talk about a little bit more of the nuance of it. But first, just your reaction to that moment in time last Monday night. Um, initially, obviously, it was terrifying uh, that it happened. You never want to see that happen in any sport or anywhere for that matter. Looking at it from, you know, sort of a sky high view, I was terrified when I heard rumblings of like, talking about when the game might resume because I'm like, there's no way. I mean, after what happened, you can't even consider playing this game. And I think ultimately the NFL did the right thing. You know, it seemed like all the players and the coaches, you know, their heads and hearts were in the game. And not only would it be a uh, extremely disrespectful to continue to play, but when people aren't engaged in what's happening, that could lead to more injuries and things like that on top of it. You know, kind of one thing I, I didn't necessarily agree with, though, I thought a lot of people, I had, I had a few people reach out to me like, this could be the end of football as we know it. Uh, you know, I could, parents across America right now are probably looking at their kids saying, uh, you're never playing this game or you're done playing football. And I don't necessarily agree with that because it, it was, there was nothing that could have happened uh, if somebody threw a, a something hard at someone in a picnic and hit him in the chest hard enough. I mean, that, that that's a scenario that really could have happened in a lot of different uh, venues other than in a football game. And I think it was more of a freak accident and occurrence 
and obviously terrifying. I mean, this doesn't take away from how horrifying the incident was, but I don't think it's an indictment on the game of football. Uh, you know, unfortunately, we've seen people collapse on a basketball floor and, and other sports venues, uh, unfortunately, many times. And I, I don't think it's anything that's, like I said, an indictment on the game itself. So ultimately, I think the NFL did the right thing by canceling the game. I know that it makes things a little weird with home field advantage, but that's not really what's important at the end of the day. It's, you know, DeMar Hamlet's well-being, and luckily he seems to be recovering very well, thankfully. It, it is one of those things that kind of just opens your eyes and, and makes you realize there's a lot of things out there that are more important than a football game. Yeah, that was what I took away from it. But I want to go back to what you said about the game and the an indictment on football. And while I agree that it's not necessarily an indictment on the game, I do think that this is something that can be used to at least highlight that football is a contact sport and can be very dangerous on your body. It can have physical ramifications and mental ramifications that can be long lasting after you play the game of football. This particular incident didn't happen because of football specifically. As you pointed out, it could happen in a lot of other areas and in a lot of other sports, but obviously it was a play that could happen on the field. It's very unlikely. And to your point though, it was about more than just football. And my disappointment was in the NFL even considering whether they were going to play the game. And I understand it. You have sponsors to make happy. You have people who play fantasy football. And there's a lot of things to consider with the playoffs right around the corner this coming weekend. But this is a man's life. And it was hanging in the balance on national television. And to even have a modicum of thinking of how can we continue this game, that was the part that disappointed me the most. And I think what I came away from in that regard was that no matter how much the NFL is going to get behind everything with all the positivity being given towards Mar Hamlin and his charity and all that, at the end of the day, though, the NFL is going to watch out for their bottom line and they were going to play this game. Like if the PA hadn't stood, if the Players Association hadn't come forward, they would have played this game. And I think that's a sad reality for me. And see, I don't know that I heard that side of it. And uh, I'd be curious to hear more if you have a few more details. But if really that's all that stopped them from playing the game, that's that's absolutely insane. Yeah, I agree. Uh, from what I understand, now the NFL came out with some statements that said it wasn't true, but there were multiple corroborated sources that said the reason that Joe Burrow started warming up was because he and the Bengals were told, you have five minutes to warm up and we're going to get back to this. Think about it, though, man. How many horrific injuries have we seen on a football field and they just kept rolling? Remember last year at the draft, the Michigan guy who had a horrific injury at his pro day and they were like, hey, just move the play 15 yards and, you know, keep on a keep going. <laughs> right. It, it honestly like it kind of reminds you of like seeing like an old war movie or battlefield, you know, where they're just like dragging the bodies off. Uh, why they continue on. And, and unfortunately, like you said, it's just a game and it's there, there's things that are way, way more important. And I tell you what, if, if they would have come out and said, hey, you know, we have sponsors to think about and, and fantasy football people. Oh, my gosh. There would have been a total meltdown, total meltdown. At the end of the day, if, if I was the NFL and you cancel that game and you caught any heat from sponsors, I would be like, you know what? We don't need your money. Get out of here. The NFL is big enough to do that, I think, too, that they could say, take a hike. If that's really what you're about, uh, you know, we don't want your uh, sponsorship or to be affiliated with you. Um, and that, that's a little extreme, I guess. But like I said, I think the NFL is big enough. They could pull something like that off. Oh, we're all about extreme here. But what has happened since then has been a lot of positivity. And I have to say that despite some of the discomfort over how the NFL is kind of trafficking in that to make themselves seem like they're a lot more wholesome than they actually are. At the end of the day, seeing the kind of money poured into the charity and all that is a good thing. He's been discharged from the hospital. He's going to get to go home. I mean, going from being intubated, having to be resuscitated to being able to go home, whether he plays another down of football is irrelevant. I'm happy because he wanted the game of life. And I don't know if you heard that story, how when he finally came to, the first thing he wrote down was, did we win the game? And I have to admit that when I hear that, like that's the makeup of a lot of athletes. It doesn't matter whether you're Michael Jordan or this guy, that competitive spirit is something I think to be admired. And I thought it was a goosebump worthy moment to hear that that was the first thing that he said. And it's not unlike war. Did we make it? You know, did did what we came here to accomplish happen, even though I was a casualty of it? I thought that part of it was actually neat. And it was nice to see the outpouring of support for him and the Bills, honestly. I think the Bills and Bengals both handled it with class. Yeah, I thought it was a great moment. It's one of those things that kind of makes everybody... It, it kind of it was the first time everyone could kind of laugh and, and kind of uh, put a smile on their face about the whole thing. And it's really great that it came from him. 
you know, to kind of bring a little, I don't know if we said levity to the whole deal, or maybe just a sigh of overwhelming sigh of relief as a whole. But I, I thought that was fantastic. And, and it's just great news moving forward. And like you said, it doesn't matter if he ever plays again or not. The fact he's alive and appears that he's going to make a pretty, pretty decent recovery from this is absolutely amazing. And the outpouring of support to the charity and, and so on, and just, just even like all the other teams, you know, but number three and some of the different things that people did to show their support was awesome. So something that's not positive. Now, these are two instances, there are incidents that have happened separately, but they have a very similar feel to them. So I'm not sure if you're hip to this Dana White story for those of you listening who maybe don't know who Dana White is. Uh, Dana White is the head of UFC, probably the most popular combat sport. He's probably one of the most recognizable figureheads in all of sports, I would say. There was a video that surfaced. He slapped his wife, basically, on New Year's Eve. And the other incident, I believe it was Chris Beard, who was the now former coach of the University of Texas basketball, came from Texas Tech. Everybody was very, very excited about this. Some of the details of that particular incident were uh, mildly uncomfortable, let's put it that way. I have a fundamental question for you, man, because we've talked about Deshaun Watson and the Trevor Bauer thing is out there. He finally got reinstated, all that mess. Are we ever going to get to a point in our society where men stop hitting women? No. And that's not saying that it's right because it's absolutely terrible. But no, I don't think so. Uh, frankly, I just think values as a country have deteriorated over time. And if anything, it may become more common in a weird way. And that's terrible to say. I'm just saying that I could see it, see it being something that even ramps up a, a little bit, especially in the day and age where you have, uh, you know, a push, I guess, for some women to identify as men and things like that. I just uh, things like that. I think there's dirt bags out there that'll take, you know, seize that opportunity to do terrible things. And I, I wish that I believed otherwise um, on this kind of situation, but I don't think it's going anywhere, unfortunately. Why does it seem like the sports world shields most of these guys? If you think about all of the people that have come through sports, and I think it's been mostly lately where we have seen people have some some ramifications or consequences for these actions. But Chris Beard is an interesting one because I think if he didn't have the kind of contract that he had that was guaranteed, he probably would have found a way to stay on as the head coach. And Dana White is probably not going to have anything happen to him. I mean, he's the head of UFC. What can you really do to him, right? You can get rid of him, but he's already made his money. Deshaun Watson gets to play football again. It's really hard sometimes to stomach these instances and these incidences because you just want better for people in general. And to your point, the fabric of this country has kind of been unraveling in a lot of different places. And it seems as if men, certain men, want to take more liberties than they ever used to. I mean, we think about the 1950s as that time where women were held down, but it seems like men of prominence just continue this trend. And I just don't understand it. And I just don't understand why so many of them seem to be in sports. Yeah, I think that the reason, and I'm just being objective here uh, for the record, but I think that the reason you see what appears to be cover-ups or some hesitation to indict people in the world of sports, especially, or any other high-profile person, is because there's always this moment of pause where the question is raised, is this someone that's just looking for a payday? Yeah, I think that that's something that always comes up. Because let's be honest, if you're a, if you were a multimillionaire, and someone came out and accused you of something, in their eyes, it may be easier just to pay that, even if it's total bullshit, it may be easier just to pay that person to shut up and go away. And now that person, you know, has got walked away with however much money. But are there, there are probably people out there who do prey on athletes and famous people for those sort of thing. But it's, just, it's sad that it always has to come up because I do think it's disrespectful to real victims of these crimes that take place. But it, it, there's always this awkward period where it seems like that sort of gets sifted out. And I think, um, and then even just the pressure that comes maybe from whether it's society or friends, family, the abuser themselves. And I think we kind of saw that a little bit maybe in the Chris Beard situation because his wife completely changed her story after the initial police report. And all of a sudden it's like, wow, well, no, he didn't choke me. I know I told you he choked me, but he didn't choke me. And he was just defending himself and like stuff like that. It's like, ah, oh, man, like I, I hate when you see that stuff happen because either either she's full of crap initially, which is unlikely because who calls 911 unless you feel like you're in danger, I would imagine. Um, or he is exactly who he's appearing to be and is using that power and fear to still control her and to control the narrative and try to save himself. Yeah, I will say this, the Dana White situation, 
you never want to see a man slap his wife or any other woman for that matter. But to me, that's something that had it not been in video and it's not something that's a common occurrence, you deal with that internally with your wife and you want to handle that kind of a thing. But it's it's on video now, so I feel like you have to answer to it. But the Chris Beard thing, that was what I took away also was the changing of the tune. And in my mind, I was thinking this tells me a lot about Chris Beard because it, there's no way that it goes from what she reported. And as you said, 911, like you and I are married men. There are times in any relationship where you get frustrated, but we've never come to that point in it. And I feel like once you cross that line, there's really no gray area. He either hits you or he didn't. There's no, well, I said he did, but he actually didn't. People don't usually embellish quite that way. I and mean, this isn't some random victim either. This is his wife, right? Or his fiance or something like that. And I feel like there is a power dynamic and a power struggle there that no matter what happened to Chris Beard, whether he got fired or stay on his head coach, that's probably something that's gonna happen again. And the sad reality of it is because of how much power he exerted on her, clearly she's gonna be a victim of that again. And it's a sad, sad thing for me. And I think that, you know, a lot of those things stem from, I guess you could say anger issues. And I think that's a hard thing to fix. That's a hard thing to be rehabilitated from is anger issues, because it's really deep and internal. and it's probably easier to kick a serious addiction than it is to fix something like that and control it all the time in difficult situations. And I guess my point is, I don't think people like that change or they don't change very easily. And to kind of circle back to the Dana White case, we were talking about this at work today and watched the video a couple of times. And we were just talking about how, okay, obviously terrible, you don't hit a woman, period, but probably both intoxicated and I think almost any person, if someone comes up and smacks them across the face, it, the, you know, just that initial reaction for a lot of people is you're swinging back, like almost with no regard of who you're swinging at. Just you hit me, I'm hitting you. You know, it's sort of the expected reaction in some ways. And obviously you plug in the fact that it's a woman and happens to be his wife and it brings in a whole nother layer of uh, chaos to the situation. But like you said, I think if there weren't cameras, that's when we probably would have never even heard of. Yeah, again, is if it's not a, a serial event, then that's something that needs to be handled. I and mean, I think in today's society, sometimes we have a little bit too much information about what goes on in people's marriages. But in that case, it's it's out there. People have cameras and somebody like Dana White should know better. And I just feel like, yeah, he might be intoxicated. She might be intoxicated. But when you are of that stature, just assume everybody's watching. Yeah, be better, be better. You got you have to know that like the you know, the spotlight's going to be on you all the time. Speaking of being better, let's talk about the national championship game since it is happening right over my right shoulder. As we currently sit here recording this, it is 38 to 7 Georgia. TCU came into this game, I believe, as you pointed out offline, the biggest underdog in national championship history, but we didn't get to talk about the actual playoff to get us here. So TCU is here because they defeated Michigan. Both of us were wildly incorrect in our assertion that the Wolverines were going to win. It was a wild game. TCU came out firing. Michigan came back. It was back and forth, back and forth. Ultimately, TCU got the W. I know there was a questionable targeting call or non-targeting call in that game. Did you see that? I did. I, I think it was targeting 10 times out of 10. How do you feel about this targeting stuff? Because in the Georgia Ohio State game, there was a play on Marvin Harrison Jr. that has been replayed over and over and over again that I believe wasn't called targeting. And watching that one, you could kind of see, all right, he seemed to turn his shoulder, but he did hit him in the head. This targeting thing is difficult to legislate. And I think that, again, goes back to what we talked about earlier. Football is dangerous and it's hard to make it any safer than we've already made it. Well, what's crazy is I feel like everybody else but the people in charge of making the call are able to see clear as day that that is or isn't targeted. I mean, it's crazy. You get on Twitter when this stuff happens and it's like unanimous. You know, everyone's like, that's targeted. That's not targeting. I don't know what is targeting. I mean, forcible contact to the head and neck area, period. Yeah. Like, uh, it seems so. Now, do I think that it's a difficult thing to avoid because I, I don't think a lot of guys, guys aren't going out there trying to uh, go after the head stuff on purpose, especially the fact that you get ejected, you miss a half of the next game. You know, they're not intentionally going out there head hunting. No. And when you're playing full speed at the speed at which these guys play the game, it's hard to control your body. These guys have better body control than anyone in the world. Almost. I mean, they're great athletes. And to ask them to be able to like manipulate their bodies 
at full speed with another person that's full speed that they have no control over. You know, they have no control over what that other person does, the ball carrier. It is just, it's impossible. Now, I think you have to have something in place because you got to try to keep people safe. But the rule itself is tough. But I think that it's pretty black and white in terms of calling it. Now, do I think that everything that gets called targeting that meets the qualifications of targeting is worthy of a penalty and an ejection? No, but that's what the rule is. I don't understand why they have such a hard time enforcing it. I will say this. I have been giving college football credit for years in the way that they implemented the rule where you call it targeting and then you go to a review. Because in today's review age, I feel like we should be leaning on the side of, well, if there's a chance to review it that we have built into it, that they should do it. In the NFL, it frustrates me when the NF- the, when the officials don't call a turnover, a turnover, they stop the play on what seems to be a fumble because if it's a turnover, folks, you can review it right afterwards. So why would you not take that built-in opportunity to get it right? Same with a scoring play. They score a touchdown, immediately reviewed. And if you overturn it, you overturn it. It means you get it right. And with targeting, you initially call it that way, and then you review it. And there is an extensive review. Like, we all see the same thing that these officials see, and most of the time, they actually seem to get it right, I think. And in this particular instance, there were two cut-and-dry instances where they had it dead to rights, And I think that they erred on the side of not calling it because of the stakes. I have some strange feeling conspiracy theory here that somebody got in their ear and said, hey, look, these games mean a lot. You know, maybe look a little bit differently than you would normally look. Is that crazy on my part? No, I think there's probably a lot of truth to what you're saying. I don't know whether any other explanation. I mean, I'm assuming these are supposed to be some of the best officials that you have in in the NCAA. And if they're not qualified to make that call when it seems like the rest of the country sees clear as day. I mean, I don't know if I saw a single person that did. They, I mean, even people who were fans of the team that came out on the right side of that were like, hey, I'm, I'm a TCU fan, but that's targeting, man. That's targeting all day. I think you're right, man. Somebody got in their ear. Somebody pulled some strings and said, eh, I don't know if we want this game to end that way. Yeah, it's sad, really. I hate being the conspiracy theory guy, but you can't, it's hard to argue against it because as we said, this isn't like week two. This is the college football playoff and there's a lot of money at stake and a lot at stake for these schools. So I, I hope that that's not what happened, but it seems more and more likely. But to go back to the play on the field, TCU came out and kind of whooped Michigan and it seemed like a game. I actually texted you at one point and said, this feels like a game that TCU is going to lose or blow, a lead that they were going to blow because it was what, 21 to three. And then at one point it was 38, 35 TCU. So Michigan came back. This is the second year in a row that Michigan has had a great season. They beat Ohio State. They've gotten to the playoff. This is a game they should have won. Hands down, this is a game that they should have won and they didn't. Do you feel like the Harbaugh Michigan teams have peaked at this point and there's something about the way that he coaches or the the makeup of his teams that seem to not be able to get over the top because it took how many years to beat Ohio State? And he's not going to be there long enough to take eight years to win his first playoff game. I mean, there must be something there. I'm more patient maybe than most people would be. I know in today's era of coaching and um, immediate gratification and results, there there are there's not a lot of room for patience. Like you said, it took him a while to get things rolling, took him a while to beat Ohio State. He's in the playoff two years. I mean, I think you got to give the guy, you know, hey, if we get two more years down the road and you, you still haven't gotten into the national title game, then maybe it's and if they've regressed. Then, yeah, I think you're looking say, OK, something here isn't right. But uh, the timeline isn't terrible in my eyes. But like I said, I'm a little more tolerant and patient being coming from a coaching background and things like that. Now, what's different at the college level is you, you have the ability to go out and hand pick your players to some degree. I mean, Michigan's got to crack it. You know, the best players in the country every year for the most part. And, you know, so they should be a little ahead of the curve compared to maybe a, a TCU or someone like that. But one thing I came away with out of those two games was that if you needed any evidence or proof that a four team playoff is fantastic, that all four of those teams deserve to be there. And that a 12 team playoff is only going to be that much better. You got it. I mean, Michigan came back. Those are two great college football games. And as a fan to watch and to think that if we could get a couple weeks of that, you know, in a 12 team playoff, great games. Yeah. You might have a couple of blowouts. That's going to happen. You know, you're going to have a year where there's a team that's just head and shoulders better than everybody else. Like LSU was a few years ago. I think they're just going to blow everybody out of the water. But 
those teams are, you know, once every five years or something, you get a team like that. Most of the time, they're going to be competitive football games, and it's going to be entertaining, which is the name of the game at the end of the day, entertainment. I feel like the 12-team playoff takes away my big complaint is that there's such a long period of time between the last game and the national title game or even the playoff games at this point. And sometimes there might be a little bit of sloppiness because it's been a while. Game speed is real. You coached. You know that if you had a long layover, you couldn't just snap back into feeling the speed of the game and getting involved in how the game is. And you can simulate that as many times you want in practice. But until you're actually there, your head's in the game, making decisions, your body moving in the way that it's supposed to move. You can't build that in. And when there's a month between the games at this point, it was what, 20 something days between the SEC championship game and the playoff. You know, Georgia comes in and looks like they're going to lose to Ohio State and Ohio State has the same layoff. I get that. But I just think that the 12 team playoff allows for there to be games every single week. And somebody like me doesn't lose interest in the national title game by the time it comes around a full month later. No, I think you're absolutely right. And you're seeing sort of the you know, your argument, I think, is being validated right now, because look at Georgia now when they're, they're playing just here a week later, uh, much sharper, much more the Georgia we saw all year for the most part. And I, I think that you're going to see better games with the shorter layoff. And it's funny because I think the the whole reasoning for the layoff and stuff was always this whole argument of finals and things like that. But I, you know what? At least they're stopping. They're, they're not pretending anymore that they care about that shit. No, they're not. And the reason that there's a layoff now so they can squeeze in the Cheez-It Bowl and the Duke's Mayo Bowl and all these other bowls that nobody gives a crap about, even if you went to the schools, I'm here to say it. And I just feel like it's time for it to be different. And with this playoff, I think we'll get that. The TCU team, I feel like, is a good story. Max Duggan obviously had a great season. He was a Heisman finalist. I knew he had a great season. I felt like he was a Heisman finalist because of the season that they had. And the Heisman has kind of turned into a quarterback award. Ironically, the quarterback who won it seems to have some emotional issues in terms of being a sore loser and has lost a couple of big games this year. Caleb Williams is going to be great in the NFL. Don't get me wrong. But Max Duggan obviously willed that team. And then on the other side, you have Georgia, who has Stetson Bennett, who I think is in, what is he, same age as Lamar Jackson, I think. Yeah, I mean, he might be in his 30s or something. <laughs> I don't know. He's up there. It's crazy. Uh, but I tell you what, though, between red shirts and the COVID year and everything else, yeah, you're seeing some of these players that are, uh, you know, have been on campus six, seven years or whatever the case. Uh, you know, Bradley's got a guy that's like playing for him now and he's like his seventh year on campus or something insane. It's funny though, because Cleve and I talk all the time about the draft and about quarterbacks, because obviously quarterbacks are the hottest commodity in the NFL. And we've seen a lot more guys be taken with so few snaps in college. I mean, look at Trey Lance. He only played one year in 2020 or one game, excuse me, in 2020. And Josh Allen didn't play a whole lot. Mitch Trubisky didn't play a whole lot. There's a litany of guys that have been drafted who just did not get a lot of snaps because they had one really good year and they came out and they were juniors and they got drafted. And I'm not saying that every quarterback should play all four years, but obviously Georgia is at an advantage because Stetson Bennett is older. And when you're older, you're more mature. He's obviously seen a lot in these games and he's a national title winner himself. So it's not like he's a slouch or anything, but do you think that quarterbacks being in programs longer would actually make them more attuned to the NFL? Because I think that the opposite end of that, re recently we've seen a lot of quarterbacks falter and they haven't had but one really good year. No, I do think there's something to be said for staying as you know for four years. And I, I understand why people don't. Uh, risk of injury. And if you've got the opportunity to go out there and make generational wealth for your family even if, if you never even play a freaking snap you know just your signing bonus and whatever else alone if you get drafted high enough i get why why people do it but i do think it would be better for their overall development if they stayed on campus longer and got coached up more and got more comfortable especially if you're with a successful program and you're going to play in a lot of high leverage games and get those uh get that experience playing at a high level in tough games, in tough moments, in tough environments. Uh, there's no substitute. I mean, practice and stuff is great, but there's no substitute for playing the game, especially in those situations. And I'm not even talking about the sure things. I'm talking about a lot of these quarterbacks, and you see it in, in the NBA too, where, oh, so-and-so declared for the NFL draft or the NBA draft, and you're like, why? Like, I feel like their talent is still very raw and they're banking on the idea that they're going to find the perfect situation and somebody's going to take that raw talent and turn it into something. 
handful of years ago when Justin Fuente took the job at Virginia Tech, they had a quarterback and he had a great year. They'd taken him from junior college. I can't remember his name right now, like Jerron something or other. I can't remember. And he declared for the NFL draft after one year. And I was blown away because he had one good year at Virginia Tech and I knew he wasn't going to get drafted. Never heard his name again. I have no idea where he's playing now. To me, that's the kind of candidate of somebody who should stay. I understand that there's a risk, but stay longer because that the game exposure, the snaps that you get just adds to your repertoire and your just overall field sense as, as opposed to thinking that because you have one and done. I mean, look at Zach Wilson. He had one great year, really. And I'm talking about spectacular year with BYU. Can't handle it in the pros. So, yeah. And Notre Dame had a running back last year. Kyron Williams was his name. And he was a really good running back for them. And he he didn't play in the, the Fiesta Bowl last year. And he went into the draft. And I think he got drafted by the Rams. And I don't think he played a lot this year. I think he was banged up and stuff a little bit. And it's like, man, like, I get it. You left. You, you got paid. But, you know, you're going to be a third string running back probably you know, wherever you go for the rest of your career, you know what I mean? Like now it didn't kill Notre Dame. They still had a kind of a three headed monster in the backfield. That's pretty good for him this year. But I mean, you know, you wonder what could that have done for his game? And maybe he moved on because the uncertainty of the coaching change and other factors, but I mean, I'm not sure if he graduated or not. I mean, I would hope he did. If not, you know, why would you, why would you leave a, a Notre Dame degree, you know, but Anyways, you know, it, it's, it, it happens all over the place. You know, it's just kind of fascinating, that whole dynamic. What do you make of the players that opt out of the bowl games? And I'm thinking, I know that there are kind of two types of players that do that. The ones that know they're going to get drafted, so they obviously don't want to risk. Like, I remember, didn't Nick Bosa do that, I think, in his last game with Ohio State, even though they were in the playoff? And that's fine. It's a business decision. But I've seen a lot of chatter of a lot of non-drafting NFL players just opting out of these bowl games. And a lot of fans are of these schools are obviously very, very upset. Like I was watching the Notre Dame South Carolina game and my in-laws have a lot of connections to South Carolina and a lot of the Carolina fans were complaining about all these kids that quit on the team. How do you feel about that? Like you said, I understand it from, you know, this, these guys that are going to get drafted, especially the ones that are going to drafted high. Totally understand uh, that decision. You know, some of the other ones, it's a little more interesting or like, you know, I heard Shane Beamer came out and said that he had guys that were going to enter the, enter the transfer portal and but they asked if they could still play in the bowl game and he's like no he's like no he's like hey I'll do whatever I'll help you do whatever you want to do but we can't have people out on the field with us that are one foot out the door it doesn't work that way and it just blows my mind like what what nerve you know what I mean like I agree with you on that. The transfer portal to me, I think has been positive. I know a lot of people don't like it because it gives the players a little bit of leverage, but coaches get to move wherever they want. And I get it. It's hard for continuity of the program and everything. But in today's world and football, you've got to get yourself in a position that you think is going to give you the maximum opportunity to succeed. But to then say, hey, look, this isn't the place for me, but can I suit up one more time? Like this ain't Rudy. Like you're not going out there. Yeah, I'm not going to sit here and, yeah, I'll do whatever I can, but to give you an opportunity and go out there and maybe take an opportunity away from a younger guy to develop or this or that, uh, just so maybe you can raise your stock a little bit or something um, in the transfer portal or whatever the case may be. I'd say what I kind of have, uh, I heard this, it's not my own original idea, I think it was like Joel Klatt or something that came out with it, but kind of a solution to these mediocre bowl games and guys holding out of the games. What if they put like uh, some sort of a cash purse on the line for these games. Like, hey, you play in the game, like the Duke's Mayo Bowl. Hey, you play in the game, you get 10 grand just for suiting up. Um, you win the game, you get 50 grand or 100 grand, whatever, whatever number you want to throw out there. Maybe the better the bowl game, uh, the higher level, the more the money uh, or whatever the case. And I know a lot of these guys have NIL deals. They're probably making more than that in some instances. But uh, I think maybe throw a little cash out there. It's going to make the game better. It might draw a few more eyes. It's going to keep some of the better players in the game, possibly. You're not going to get the, the first round NFL guys to play still, but some of these other dudes would probably still suit up. Yeah, and some of these games might actually be better. Let's move on to the NFL, my man, because the playoffs are now right around the corner. The playoff field is set. And I'm pretty excited about it. The last week of the season was interesting for many reasons, obviously with the DeMar Hamlin thing happening. But there are a lot of teams still kind of jockeying for a position. And with all of the hoopla about how home field advantage was going to be given, first question I want to ask you, the NFL came up with, I thought, a good idea. Like if the Chiefs and Bills meet in the AFC Championship game, possibly have it on a neutral field because there's a lot of what ifs there. So let's take some of those factors out. The one decision that I really didn't understand was the NFL said to the Bengals, okay, you've won your division. 
one of the things that you get by winning a division is a home game in the first round at least. So the Bengals are told they win the division and then right after that, the NFL tells them, but if you lose to the Ravens this week, home field is gonna be determined by a coin toss. That to me has zero logic behind it. I do not understand how somebody thought and then actually implemented that. Yeah, I don't either. The coin toss thing was super weird. It's like the rules are the rules. I think I saw somebody tweet, the rules are the rules until they aren't anymore. (laughs) And it it doesn't make any sense. You know, they came out and said, hey, like your record is what it is. The, The seeds are what they are. And that's it. So to add that caveat there at the last minute was strange. And luckily, we're not going to have that happen. No, we're not. The Bengals took care of business and a lot of teams took care of business. So just to kind of break it down here, the NFC looks like this. The number one seed is the Philadelphia Eagles. Jalen Hurts came back and righted the ship a little bit. They looked a little iffy with Gardner Minshew. So I think there was no way Hurts wasn't going to come back. So they will get the one by. The number two seed is the San Francisco 49ers, who I'm very, very bullish on. I just think that they are peaking at the right time. And they get the Seattle Seahawks. So the Seahawks had to kind of fight their way into the playoffs. They started out six and three, kind of like the Jets, petered out at the end of the season. But Geno Smith had himself a 4,000 yard, 30 touchdown season. So he obviously had a great year. San Francisco will host the Seattle Seahawks. And I think that that is a game, while it's a divisional game, it seems like a game that the 49ers should win. The Minnesota Vikings and the New York Giants. This to me is the fool's gold bowl. Like neither one of these teams seems like they're for real. And I'm just not sure which one of them the clock is going to strike midnight on. And this is the game I want to ask you about because this one is pissing off a lot of people. The Dallas Cowboys, who I think won 13 or 12 games this year, are traveling to the eight and nine Tampa Bay Bucks who won their division. That feels like a trap game. Yeah, we talked about this earlier in the year. I remember saying like, hey, like you're going to get the freaking NFC South winner and probably the AFC South winner going to be 500 or maybe sub 500 and host a freaking playoff game uh, against a much better opponent. And it is a trap game. And, And I think the only reason I even say that is because of one man. And that's Tom Brady, man. And I know he hasn't been Tom Brady, vintage Tom Brady, but it's if there's a time he's going to show up, this is it. And Dallas didn't look great last week at all. And if if there's any sort of uh, fallout for that or, you know, maybe some sort of doubt starts to creep in or whatever, uh, they might be in trouble. I, I definitely I'd like to see Dallas make a run. Gosh, I mean, I, I can't believe I'm going to say this. I feel like they deserve it a little bit. Their wow. fans deserve it a little bit. And and that deserve might not be the right word, but it's been so freaking long. I I think, and and really it's kind of one of those things like baseball is better when the Yankees are good. NFL is better when the Cowboys are good uh, as much as it pains a lot of people. So no, but you're right. A trap game. That's a good explanation. And I think that, uh, I think Minnesota takes care of business with the giants. It might be a battle for a while, but I, I, I think that the Vikings sneak by them. For sure. But the the Cowboys, Dak has been decidedly average since coming back from injury. And I heard a take today that said that Dak may become the new Eli Manning. And I'm like, well, you got to have a a run through the playoffs and beat an undefeated Patriots team. So I don't think that's ever going to happen. But Dak, I think, leads the league in interceptions for starting quarterbacks. I mean, it's it's not been pretty. And I made the argument today to my wife that at the end of the game yesterday, they knew they weren't going to be able to get the number one seed. So maybe pull some players, but they didn't look great ahead of that that either the Cowboys are that team that are they're they're coming down at the wrong time and the Bucks haven't exactly looked great but I feel like when you play a home game and when the playoffs are here Tom Brady's a different guy and he has the ability to to will his team out I mean I heard this too this might be one of his easiest roads to a Super Bowl he's ever had remember the last time he won a Super Bowl he took out Rodgers Breeze and Mahomes <laughs> right no you're absolutely right man because like you said Dak has not been impressive and you know having the four seed if if there's an upset in one of the other games, you know, they might, they might luck out and not have to play the Eagles and and, and who knows, but I mean, and I don't even know that that's a terrible matchup. I mean, it's the playoffs. Everybody is, you're going to get everybody's best shot at this point in time. It just depends on who can perform when the lights are on. Now, unfortunately for you, the Detroit lions almost made it almost. Yeah. Baker Mayfield. I tell you what, that guy single-handedly cost three teams from making the playoffs this year. The Carolina Panthers, the Detroit Lions, and I mean, I guess the Rams, it's not really fair to pin the Rams on them because they were already pretty much out of it before he got involved. But And that sucks because you know, we've talked about it. I like Baker. and But gosh, he was so bad at the end of that game. He was really, really bad at the end of that game. 
goodness. Yeah. So bad. And it sucks. But you know what? I love the fact that, you know, Motor City Dan Campbell got the boys. Uh, uh, they still went out there and they said, you know what? I think he was quoted as saying this, you know, hey, whatever. We didn't make it, but we still don't want the Packers to make it. You know, so they went out and played ball. I liked actually hearing that because the way that the NFL flexed the schedule really screwed over the Lions because they were they were going to know what their fate was heading into this game, whether it was winner in or whether they were out. And a lot of people felt that it gave a competitive advantage to the Packers for the Lions to know this. But I was like, here's the thing. The Packers have been beaten up on the Lions ever since Brett Favre got there. They're tired of it. So if they can take out a rival, they're going to do it. And you know what? Motor City Dan Campbell got those boys from one and six to nine and eight. Yeah, it's awesome. And like, and that's the thing too, is obviously he's earned the right to, to keep his job. And you don't want to, you want to keep building on this momentum that you have. You're not going to go out there and pack it in, you know, the last week of the season. You know, you, you want to keep the ball rolling into the off season and try to build some momentum into, excuse me, into next year. And, and you know, it's a division rival at their place. And you're going to keep them out of the, there are plenty of reasons to go out there and play their best football game. I agree. And especially since it's so damn cold that you see how everybody was bundled up, like, just go out there and play, man, because that's the only way to keep warm. So I think that if I'm looking at this NFC field, NFC field right now, the 49ers to me are the team that is peaking the most. I mean, they look great. And the crazy part about it is Brock Purdy is not the reason that they're here. I think it's the fact that the offense is very much designed for guys like him to come in, not make a lot of mistakes. And Honestly, man, this season, we've seen a ton of quarterbacks come in with no experience and and hold their own. I mean, Cooper Rush earlier in the year, you don't turn the ball over, you're going to have success. And that team seems to be firing on all cylinders right now. And Kyle Shanahan is a great coach. He's probably one of the best in the league. Watch out for the 49ers, man. I'm really, really feeling them. Well, and let's let's not forget the fact that you could understand about eight weeks ago why anybody was so high on the 49ers. Yeah, I couldn't. I, I, I will admit to that. With Jimmy G, they were scoring 20 points a game, and now right. they're scoring in the 30s. So fundamental difference, and they didn't have CMC back then either. Right. No, you're right. And I think that you're right. They're peaking at the right time. They definitely look the best right now. And I, I've always believed that whoever's playing the best football this time of year has a distinct advantage heading into the playoffs. And I remember back the last time the Steelers, I think, won the Super Bowl might have been when Jerome Bettis was still there. It's like, you know, they kind of were so-so early in the year and they just caught fire and they were absolutely playing the best going into the playoffs and it just kept rolling. You talk about quarterbacks and these teams putting in backup quarterbacks that are having success. I wonder if some of that is a result of seeing how how much of a fall off there is with these teams who get the starter hurt and there's such a big drop off to the backup. And maybe they're structuring their offenses differently to make it easier to plug get the plug and play with a lesser talented player. Uh, maybe just the backup quarterbacks are more talented than they've been in a long time. The quarterback pool might be deeper. I mean, sure, you have your guys that are generational talents, your Rodgers, your Josh Allen's Mahomes, but... You know, I wonder with some of these new offensive coordinators, these young guys with their high powered offenses, if, if they're just kind of schematically set up a little bit different to be a little more user friendly to injuries and be able to plug and play. It's more of a system than it is relying upon the individual's talent. Plus, a guy like Purdy has played multiple seasons as a starter at Iowa State. So like we talked about earlier, more snaps, more game scenarios. And so perhaps he's not as afraid or scared of the bright lights of the NFL. So let's move to the AFC, man. So you mentioned the AFC South and you talked about how a team from the AFC South might get in with a losing record. If not for this man, I think Motor City Dan Campbell might be up for coach of the year, maybe even Dayball from the Giants. But Doug Peterson and the Jacksonville Jaguars finished nine and eight and won the AFC South. And I think at one point they were three and six or three and seven, finished nine and eight. He is a great coach, and I think that showing the the growth of this team, Trevor Lawrence was playing like an elite quarterback at the end of the year. Now, that game against the Titans was offensive in many ways just because it was a shitty game, but the Jaguars are the team I feel like I might be rooting for them to make the Super Bowl. I'd love to see it. They got Trevor Lawrence is very likable. As much as you see some guys that are very successful at the college level, you know, the Tim Tebow's of the world, it's like you either love them or you hate them, this or that. Trevor Lawrence never seemed that polarizing to me. He was easy to root for, very talented, just kind of quiet. I like that. I don't like a lot of flash and pizzazz and whatever comes along, arrogance. 
And they've got some young guys down there that are extremely talented. Doug Peterson is making Urban Meyer look like a complete dirtbag <laughs> in many ways. And I'm with you, buddy. Like, I'm on the Jags bandwagon. It's just an, it's a nice story. But they're also getting another team that has been playing really well, and that's the Chargers. Another team that I didn't understand the hype around. I think you were in that boat, too, because I believe we both said that if Staley can't get Herbert to the playoffs, then he's wasting him. I think we both might have said that. And the Chargers actually did make the playoffs, and they seem to be peaking at the right time. It's an interesting matchup, both of those teams playing each other in Jacksonville. But hey, the Jacksonville Jaguars have a winning record, so they deserve to host this playoff game. No, I agree. And I think I've always been kind of high on the Chargers because of how good Justin Herbert is uh, and the talent that they've had on their roster. You know, I think that obviously Brandon Staley has saved his job uh, because early in the year we were wondering, I mean, even like some of the pundits, you know, were talking about how, you know, who was going to be the next coach uh, for the Chargers because things were not looking great. And as an organization, they didn't want to waste the talent they had on Staley trying to figure it out, you know, but there's two more great games still in the AFC. And, you know, we get the the Ravens and Bengals rematch. And I think Lamar is going to come back for it. My brother-in-law was asking me why Lamar has been out this long. It was it holding out or was it injury? And I said, you know, it might be a combination of both, but I think Lamar is going to come back and play. The Ravens just don't have a lot of talent. I'll be honest. I don't don't think they have a lot of talent. I think because Harbaugh is their coach, he's a great coach, Super Bowl winning coach. And obviously they're better with Lamar Jackson out there. I just think the Bengals are better. No, I love the Bengals. I'm sky high on the Bengals. Oh, I know. You're a Joe Burrow guy. Oh my gosh. I'm sky high on the Bengals. But I tell you what, it's tough to beat a team back to back twice in a row, especially if the Lamar Jackson comes out and plays. You know, he's kind of the X factor in this game, I think. And, you know, like I said, I don't, I, who knows if he's going to play or not. I would imagine he does if he's healthy enough to play. And that would certainly make things interesting. But uh, you're not going to get me off the Bengals. Did you see what Joe Burrow said today? That the window for them to win a Super Bowl is his entire career. What a great, great quote. That's so awesome. No, I love that. He gets it. He does, man. And one of my other favorite things about him is that Urban Meyer passed on him. Mm-hmm. And, and here he is. Fuck Urban Meyer. The last game of the AFC wildcard round is the Bills and Dolphins. So the Dolphins snuck in because the Patriots couldn't beat the Bills, which we all knew was going to happen. And the Jets couldn't score more than six points with Joe Flacco. And the Dolphins are coming in. Skyler, I don't even know what his name is. I can't remember what his name is. Third string guy for the Dolphins. Skyler something or other is going to be the starting quarterback, I think, because I just don't think that you can have Tua come back with all the concussion stuff. And the Bills are just on a roll, an emotional roll. Now that they're past all that stuff, they whoop the Patriots' ass. I think it's going to be Bills by a lot. But the Dolphins were the darling of the ball a few months back. You were all over them. And injuries obviously play a huge role. But Tua and the Dolphins had been declining before that injury. I think it's not quite their year just yet. No, I think they're moving in the right direction, though. And, you know, it's it's big boy football now. And I think that I think Mike McDaniel's up for it, but it's different. You know, to go play in Buffalo in January, you know, it, it's a different deal all around and especially in the playoffs. So you know, we'll see what you know, how things go. But I'm with you, man. Emotion is a very underrated thing. Everybody thinks about emotion in the negative way. I think when it comes to sports, people get too emotional in the negative sense and it costs them, but there's not a lot of talk about how positive emotion can propel you uh, to great things. And and they've got one of the most powerful sources of that right now with the DeMar Hamlin situation. And I think that you're going to see them really draw from that uh, throughout the playoffs. That and I think the falling short the last two seasons to the Chiefs is going to be a big motivating factor. Chiefs are the number one seed. They're going to get a bye. But let me ask you something. In years past, when we've seen... Patrick Mahomes' stat line, we've been wowed by it, right? And then he loses Tyreek Hill. Coming into the season, we wondered if that was going to be a detriment to that offense. When you think about his season this year, he's probably going to be the MVP. I think maybe even the unanimous MVP. But do you think he had otherworldly stats this year just based off of how little, I guess, press the Chiefs got for being as good as they were? You, you kind of wonder if it's one of those things everyone just has come to expect, you know? So it's not, it doesn't seem like it's this crazy great thing that's like well that's just Patrick Mahomes that's just the Chiefs and that does stink because it it sort of like downplays what he's doing and what they're accomplishing there and how special it is Um, I I do think that kind of that's the case here they're really good 
And I, I'm kind of one of those. Like I'm like, okay, you get your few years to be good, then go away. It's, it's someone else's turn. But I don't know if that's going to happen this year. Well, the reason I bring this up is because we're used to Mahomes putting up gaudy stats, but we're also used to seeing the big plays with Tyreek Hill down the field and even Kelsey to an extent. And the look of the offense this year was very much not that. I think with Tyreek Hill going out, the idea was, well, let's have him dink and dunk on us. And Patrick Mahomes this season dinked and dunked his way to 5,200 yards, 41 touchdowns. And that's the true sign of a of a pro, right? If if you can, if they can take away maybe what you do best and you can still find a way to be successful, that's why he's going to be the MVP. Oh, yeah. And I, I did not realize his stats were this gaudy. So I think that we've set ourselves up for a lot of excitement. But before we move on to the last segment, this is Black Monday as we're recording this. So a lot of coaches get fired. We obviously know Nathaniel Hackett got fired. You weren't as big on that as I was. Cliff Kingsbury got fired today. So he is gone. And I kind of saw that happening. Lovey Smith, we all knew that was going to happen. There's going to be a lot of head coaching gigs come up here. None of these head coaches getting fired really surprises me. I think Dan Campbell, as you pointed out, saved his season the way that they ended the season. And I think that it'll be interesting to see how these teams fill their vacancies, especially the Broncos, because they showed some life after Hackett was gone at the end of the season. Russ kind of looked a little bit more like himself. That's a good situation. The Texan situation stinks. They couldn't even lose to keep the first pick in the draft. <laughs> right. And uh, Lovey Smith doing his old team a favor uh, by going out there and getting the W. And how about the Colts, man? Just totally melting at the end of that game. The Colts looked like warmed over dog shit the last few games. And Jeff Saturday is a good guy. Don't get me wrong, but you could just stop there. I, it's just it was bad. Sam Ellinger or Ellinger, however the hell you say his name. We may not see him in the NFL again. He's terrible. It doesn't matter. Yeah, you won't have to say it anymore after right now. That's the last time it'll ever be said in regards to him playing the game of football professionally. And think about this. The last thing that Frank Reich did was bench Matt Ryan for Sam Ellinger. <laughs> I guess go out with a bang. I don't know. You talked about the Broncos. Uh, did you hear that Sean Payton is interviewing for the Broncos job? Yeah, I, I hope that Sean Payton just takes a job. I don't want this to become the Bill Cowher thing where we wonder every single year, is he going to come back? Is he going to come back? Like, just take a head coaching job. And the Saints are going to have to get, get a haul for him because he's still an employee of theirs. So just take a head coaching job. Like at this point, I don't care what you do. Just do it and let and then leave other jobs for other people. But I will be fascinated to see how that plays out because there are a lot of names out there. 49ers, D'Amico Ryan. Remember him from the Texans? He's their defensive coordinator. He's going to get some calls now for head coaching gigs. So a lot of these guys that are up and coming, I think are very, I think they're very exciting. And I want to see what happens with the Texans mostly because when they have the number two pick in the draft, it's obviously going to be a great pick, but they need a quarterback. So they should. They needed to be number one. And it's amazing because I'm, I'm imagining Lovey Smith after the season, right? He goes to the the, conf, the the press conference and they ask him, so do you think you'll be back next season? He's like, well, of course I expect to be back next season. And then his phone rings. And it's like, oh, oh, so you want to see me? Okay, hold on. Right. And then he gets fired because he won a damn game. Like he got fired because he won the last game of the season. Think about that. Yeah, it's ridiculous. And I, I loved his explanation. He's like, "How we go out there and fight every week all year, and all of a sudden now we're not supposed to do yes, that. Yes, I agree. You know, good for him. Uh, you know, I commend him for doing that. And uh, one thing I'm curious to see happen, you know, in the whole coaching carousel is where are some of these uh, head coaches that have gotten fired, where they maybe end up as coordinators. I know we talked about it earlier in the year with about the Chargers, like maybe Frank Reich laying in a place like the Los Angeles Chargers to be the offensive coordinator. Uh, things like that. You know, there could be some of those things that happen that really propel some of these teams uh, to the next level, getting them the league coordinator. Cliff Kingsbury to the Patriots for offensive coordinator. Make it happen. Do you think he could handle Belichick? You think he would like, he would, he, you think he'd bend the knee? Bend the knee? Don't forget, he played for the Patriots. He was a backup for Brady for a year. That's got to be a, God, can you imagine that job being the backup for Tom Brady? I mean, I, I just think it's got to be rough. This is a long time ago. This was, God, 06, 07, 08, something like that. But, I mean, he's been there. And to be honest with you, Cliff Kingsbury should thank his lucky stars that he was even a head coach in the NFL because he failed upward more than anybody I've ever seen in the pro ranks ever. Yeah, I agree. Yeah, no doubt about that. I was going to say, I kind of felt like that about Matt Rule a little bit. But he had more success at Baylor than I think Kingsbury had at Texas Tech. So, you know, I don't know if they just thought that he was just some sort of offensive genius or what. 
I've never understood how anybody could look at Cliff Kingsbury's resume, see that he never won 10 games and coach Patrick Mahomes at Texas Tech and be like, this is a, that's not the guy for you. Like you see what he's doing now and you coached him in college and you didn't do anything with him. Yeah. How do you get one of those jobs being the person that can make that decision? You know, was that an ownership decision? Was that a GM decision? I can't imagine there'd be a GM out there that would have the stones to make that make that higher. I mean, because you you're li literally your, your career is hooked. Your wagon's hooked to that that train, man. And you're going to go as he goes. And obviously it didn't go well. Mike Leach would have won a national title with Patrick Mahomes. Just saying. Gosh, he would have passed for 10,000 yards. Yeah, he would have. It would have been insane. And then he would have failed at the NFL because the air raid doesn't translate to the NFL. So it would have been give or take there. Uh, I want to get your thoughts, though. Early Super Bowl prediction. Who do you have making the Super Bowl? Bengals and the 49ers. Those, that's my Super Bowl pick. And there, there's going to be a lot of people that might not like that because I tell you, the AFC is stacked. Um, I think almost every team in the playoffs in the AFC is capable of making the run. NFC, I think, you know, 49ers, Eagles, Cowboys, maybe have a shot. And maybe it's going to hurt the uh, the AFC having to run through the gauntlet. We'll see. But I'm going to stick with Bengals and 49ers. And who do you have winning? Bengals. Joe Burrow, man. I just want to see it happen so bad. I, I would be really happy to see that. I just like him. Very likable guy. Cincinnati, they deserve a freaking championship. Yeah, give me the Bengals. According to you, the Cowboys deserve one. The Bengals deserve one. Anybody else you want to add to that list? We're like Oprah, man. You get a Lombardi <laughs> trophy. You get a Lombardi trophy. I like you get it. a Lombardi trophy. I like it. So I'm with you. I think that the 49ers are going to make it, but I have them against the Bills. I just think that all the failures of the last few years, coupled with the DeMar Hamlin situation, I think that they're hungry. They're motivated. And I just love the way that they are playing football. And I think that ultimately when it comes down to it, I think they are going to win the Super Bowl. I think that it'd be a great matchup. It'd be great to see Brock Purdy win one. And I think that if he cements himself by getting there, playing well, he may be the quarterback of the future there. I don't know. I mean, I know Trey Lance is there and they obviously see a lot of potential in him. But if you got a guy that took you to the Super Bowl and nearly won it, playing better than Jimmy G did the year that they went, you got to think about keeping that guy around. So that's it. Coach and I have picked the Bengals to win the Super Bowl and the Bills to win the Super Bowl. We have absolutely no love for the NFC whatsoever. We will see what happens. We have about a month to go before that. A lot of football to be played. And before we get out of here, we have one more thing to do. Obviously, we have sunset crunch time until next NFL season, but OTW is still on the books. We will start with the Iceman stat of the week. Coach, I mentioned Cliff Kingsbury getting fired, but did you know in their nearly 100 years of existing as an organization, the Cardinals franchise has never had a head coach for more than six years? That's insane. I mean, it doesn't surprise me so much recently just because the way the business is. But it shocks me that back in the day, there wasn't some guy they just kept around just because. Yeah. So Cliff Kingsbury getting fired after, what, four years, I think. This might have been his fourth season. Continues on that trend. And honestly, I think that there's not a lot of people in the NFL that are going to stick around that long. Mike Tomlin and Bill Belichick are outliers. Belichick's coming back for his 24th year. Mike Tomlin still never had a losing season even with that shitty roster that they have he somehow scraped his way to nine and eight this season you know i feel like the pittsburgh steelers are almost like the, the st louis cardinals of the nfl just they're sort of like the embodiment of what the league's supposed to be about just very consistent always above average for the most part outside of a few outliers i, I don't know i i guess that's just my comp but no, good for the Steelers, good for Mike Tomlin. Nice to see them uh, find a way to maintain some level of success, even in the face of adversity when it comes to their roster. My friends, it is time for Coach's Pick of the Week. I went back into the archives to find his few last picks. And at this point in time, the coach is 5-6-2 and two on the season. Last week was Justin Fields only plus six over the Detroit Lions. And that did not work out as I believe the Lions won 31 to 10. And that gets us to this week. So coach, please bless us with your picketh of the week. Hear ye, hear ye, peasants and mediocre gamblers amongst you. I have a winner for you this week. 
We all believe it. I believe even the Iceman will be with me on this one. The Jacksonville Jaguars are actually one-point underdogs at home this week against the LA Chargers. Give me the Jags, and obviously by covering the spread, they will win the game. So give me the Jags straight up this week over the Chargers in the first round of the playoffs. The Jacksonville Petersons straight up over the Los Angeles Chargers. So let it be written. So let it be done. All right, man, only a few more picks to redeem yourself for the season, but I was delighted to know that you are hovering around 500. I know you want to be either good or bad, but I think mediocre just means that you're like every other gambler out there in the world. So exceptionally mediocre. You cannot get more mediocre than five, six, and two. To have two pushes on there is absolutely ridiculous. But, you know, you're right. It would be better to be really good or really bad. I've somehow managed to be pretty much right down the middle. As my friend Ryan would say, a steaming pile of disappointment. We have reached the end of the episode, my man. First one of the season with the two of us. The playoffs are here. We are kind of winding down our football coverage in a month, and we do have some news on that that will be announced a little bit later this week. So please watch out on all of our social medias. But do you have any parting thoughts before we get out of here? Um, Iceman, you know, we're winding down on what is the best season of the year being college, uh, college and pro football season. But, we, you know, the best part is the playoffs. And I'm looking forward to seeing how things transpire over the next uh, month, really. And, you know, I'm sure there'll be some upsets, uh, things like that. that will be fun to watch and kind of moving on into some other sports. March Madness uh, will be here before we know it. I'm a big wrestling guy. We'll have the NCAA wrestling tournament coming up in March and then right into baseball. So it just keeps on rolling. And most of all, I'm just grateful that we get the opportunity to get together every week and do this. Could not agree more. Before we get you out of here, please follow the Pup Time Podcast wherever you find your podcasts. And on Twitter, it's where Brad does his other podcasting. Please visit the Matty Ice Media Network, mattyicemedia.com for all the other podcasts that we have, including Political Football, which is still a weekly live show that they do on YouTube. If you are listening on Apple and Spotify, please remember to follow. Please remember to give us some stars. It keeps us charting. It would be nice to chart at least once in my lifetime. So it would be great if the listeners could help us out on that. I'm glad that you tuned in. Thank you for your patronage. I hope that this finds you well. I hope that this finds you safe. And for me and Coach, this is Iceman and Coach. The opinions and viewpoints expressed on the Iceman and Coach Sports Show are those of Matt Freights, Brad Powell, and their guests, and not necessarily those of the Matty Ice Media Network. The Iceman and Coach Sports Show is exclusively owned by Matt Freights and Brad Powell and is brought to you by the Matty Ice Media Network.